We're going to turn now to First Minister's questions, but before I call the first question from Jackson Carlo, uh, the First Minister would like to make a brief statement. First Minister. Uh, Presiding officer, before I take questions, I'm grateful for the opportunity to make a very short statement. Uh, members will be aware that I have accepted the resignation of Derek Mackay as Finance Secretary. Uh, Derek Mackay has apologised unreservedly for his conduct and recognised, as I do, that it was unacceptable and falls seriously below the standard required of a minister. I can also advise that he has this morning been suspended from both the SNP and our parliamentary group pending further investigation. However, I also wanted to formally confirm to Parliament that the Government will proceed as planned with the Scottish Budget this afternoon. It will be delivered by the Minister for Public Finance, Kate Forbes, and will set out our plans to sustainably grow our economy, support our public services and step up action to tackle the climate emergency. All of that, presiding officer, continues to be very, the very clear focus of the Scottish Government. Thank you, First Minister. We turn now to the first question. Jackson Carlo. Uh, thank you, presiding officer. I had fully intended to ask questions on other matters this morning, but the First Minister's short statement does require questions by way of follow-up. Uh, First Minister, given the evidence of the texts now in the public domain, uh, what does the First Minister believe the behaviour of her former Finance Secretary does for the reputation of her government, this Parliament and Scottish politics generally? First Minister. Uh, well, I think the conduct um, is unacceptable um, and uh, I uh, will not make any attempt uh, to say otherwise or to minimise in any way the seriousness of that. Uh, based on what I knew about this last night, it was clear to me then that Derek Mackay's conduct fell uh, far short of what is expected of a minister. Indeed, he offered his resignation to me and I accepted it was not an option for him to remain in government. Uh, this morning, of course, I have uh, read the full uh, transcript that was published in The Sun and it is on that basis that he has also been suspended uh, from both the SNP and the parliamentary group pending uh, further investigation. Uh, I think having uh, taken that action, which I think is appropriate in the circumstances, it is now not just uh, reasonable but important to allow uh, that further investigation and consideration uh, to take place uh, without me pre-empting that uh, and I hope members will accept uh, that course of action. Jackson Carlin. Um, as Mr Mackay has 26,000 followers on Twitter alone, many parents will be concerned over what assurances the First Minister has received that this is the only example of his unacceptable behaviour and whether she believes any assurances she received are credible. And given that the victim in all of this is a 16-year-old boy, and I've had, heard no mention of his welfare, what contact has either the SNP or the First Minister's office had, or will they be having, with him and or his family at any point, and what support has been offered? First Minister. Uh, well, can I say very clearly, I am not aware of, of any uh, further allegations or any uh, conduct of a similar nature, but I should stress I was not aware of this um, until uh, last evening. Um, and I very much hope uh, that Jackson Carlaw will accept that. Um, I uh, very much want to make clear, and um, I hope members would uh, accept this of uh, my view without me saying it, but I think it is important that I do say it, that I do not condone in any way, shape or form uh, conduct uh, of this nature and um, I and I think all politicians have to reflect on the need for us to say that when it is our opponents uh, that uh, are accused of such behaviour and also when it is people on our own side in our own parties um, and I think all of us have to be consistent in that and I will always uh, strive to be. Um, of course uh, there is uh, the issue raised uh, by these particular uh, allegations and what is uh, published in the newspaper this morning of the welfare uh, of a 16-year-old uh, boy. Uh, I am not uh, aware of the identity or the contact details of the family. Um, if the family uh, or the individual concerned uh, wanted to speak to me, I would of course be happy uh, to do that um, and uh, that is uh, my position. Um, but I, I really hope um, that members across this chamber, all parties, um, have faced 
uh, difficult uh, allegations about members of their own parties in recent times and all of us have to um, I think be prepared to apply high standards uh, when these allegations are, are about colleagues of our own and make sure that the conduct uh, and the action rather that we are demanding of our opponents is uh, action that we apply ourselves and that's what I will strive uh, to do here uh, but uh, whatever questions uh, are, are posed to me today uh, there will be no sense uh, in which I seek to minimise uh, the serious nature of what we are discussing. Jackson Cup. That to be confirmation that neither the Scottish Government nor the SNP has had any independent contact with this young man or his family at all. Um, in as much as the identity is not known, so that would therefore not be possible. The First Minister has previously said in Chamber that the internet can often be an unsafe place for young people. All MSPs can play our part in our communities in raising awareness and helping to educate parents about the steps that they can take to keep their children safe online. The Parliament has taken issues of exploitation incredibly seriously. And I have to ask the First Minister, can the reputation of Scottish politics and this Parliament be maintained with the full confidence of the public or even his constituents if Mr Mackay remains as a member? First Minister. Well, clearly there are issues uh, that Denny Mackay will require to reflect on. I am responsible for the actions I take, clearly, firstly, as First Minister, in terms of the ministerial code. Um, based on what I knew last night, as I've already said, it was clear to me that uh, Derek Mackay remaining in government was simply not an option. Uh, and in any event, uh, I should be very clear, he offered his resignation because he clearly uh, recognised that as well. Uh, having seen uh, the fuller detail uh, this morning of what uh, appeared in the newspaper, uh, further action has been taken in terms of his uh, membership of the SNP and the parliamentary group. Uh, there is a point, uh, no matter how... Uh, upset and shocked uh, all of us are when faced with situations like this. There is also the need for uh, due process and therefore he has been suspended pending uh, further investigation and I do believe it is right uh, and proper to allow that to happen before I in any way preempt what the outcome of that will be. But clearly there are very serious matters uh, for me as First Minister to have had to deal with and contend with and respond to um, over the last number of hours and there will be matters that Derek Mackay himself I'm sure is reflecting on and will continue to have to reflect on. Jackson Carroll. First Minister, I appreciate the difficulty but the NSPCC definition on grooming is as follows. Grooming is when someone builds a relationship, trust and emotional connection with a young person so they can manipulate, exploit or abuse them. Young people can be groomed online by someone who has targeted them. This could be a dominant and persistent figure through the use of social media networks, text messages and apps like WhatsApp. And whether online in person, groomers can use tactics like taking them on trips or outings or holidays. The young people may not understand they've been groomed. They may have complicated feelings like loyalty and admiration. That is the NSPCC definition on grooming. I understand the First Minister wants to defer to an investigation, but the full content of the text exchanges between Mr Mackay and this young man are available online today. How difficult is it not to reconcile his conduct with really the very worst connotation? First Minister. I, I, I'm not sure if Jackson Carlaw has been paying proper and close attention to my answers. I am in no way uh, minimising the seriousness of what uh, we are discussing today. It is not the case that I am deferring to an investigation before action has been taken. Derek Mackay is no longer a member of my government. He is suspended from my party. He is currently suspended from my parliamentary group. So uh, in the action that has been taken already, I think it should be obvious to everybody uh, how seriously I, uh, my government and my party uh, treat this matter. Uh, but in terms of uh, further action, uh, for anybody in any circumstances uh, where others have to consider uh, future action, there is a, a degree of due process that has to be gone through. That would be the case for a member of uh, Mr Carlos' party, just as it is for mine. But in the action that has already been taken, um, I don't think anybody can reasonably doubt the seriousness with which I uh, treat this matter and will continue to treat this matter. Thank you. Question number two, Richard Leonard. Presiding Officer, Derek Mackay this morning described his own behaviour as foolish, but Derek Mackay's actions 
towards a schoolboy are beyond foolish. They are an abuse of power. They are nothing short of predatory. So this is serious. And whilst his suspension from the SNP is welcome, he should go as a member of this parliament. Let me turn to another serious matter. This week, the long-awaited report from Dr. David Strang following his independent inquiry into mental health services in NHS Tayside was published. It was released on the fifth anniversary of the funeral of Mandy McLaren's son, Dale. He was 28 years old. The report vindicates Mandy, Gillian Murray, and the other courageous families. It shows that time and time again, NHS Tayside ignored their concerns and were defensive and dismissive in their dealings with them. So will the First Minister today apologise to Mandy McLaren, Gillian Murray and the other families? And will she give them a guarantee that all 51 recommendations in the report published this week will be implemented in full? First Minister. Well, firstly, as I have said previously in this chamber and uh, readily uh, and unreservedly say so again, I uh, offer apologies to any uh, patient or the family, including uh, the family cited by Richard Leonard today, uh, who have been in any way let down uh, by the National Health Service. Uh, I know that for uh, these families, the publication of this report will have been extremely difficult and my thoughts and sympathies uh, remain uh, with them and with all families who have been bereaved uh, through suicide. Um, in terms of the recommendations of this report, as Richard Leonard uh, will be aware, NHS Tayside has accepted the recommendations in full. Uh, these uh, recommendations must be implemented and the concerns uh, that this report uh, sets out must be addressed. Uh, we expect uh, Tayside, uh, NHS Tayside and its partners to respond with a plan describing how they will deliver the necessary improvements by the end of uh, this month. Uh, we make very clear to the board and uh, to others uh, how seriously we treat this report um, and that they must deliver the change required. And the Min Minister for Mental Health uh, retains uh, very close oversight uh, of the actions that the board will take in the weeks ahead. Richard Leonard. Uh, First Minister, the reason I ask you for uh, this guarantee about the implementation of all 51 recommendations is because I spoke to Gillian Murray just this morning uh, and she told me, and I quote her, that it is terrifying that these are only recommendations. NHS Tayside has a history of evading scrutiny, of deflecting criticism and of resisting change. They have repeatedly ignored recommendations from the Healthcare Improvement Scotland Service and the Mental Welfare Commission. And again this week, Dr Strang revealed that the one and only recommendation of his interim report has still not been delivered. First Minister, when I raised this with you last October, you said, I expect NHS Tayside to take account to take account of the recommendations that David Strang has made thus far. But they haven't. So what confidence can the families have today that anything will be any different this time round? First Minister. Uh, well, we will continue uh, to work with the Health Board and make very clear that expectation. I know that the uh, Minister for Mental Health is uh, willing to make a statement and keen to make a statement on uh, this particular issue after uh, next week's parliamentary recess. Uh, we have also, the government has asked Dr David Strang uh, to do uh, an update of his report uh, after a period of time uh, to make sure that those uh, recommendations are being implemented um, and we expect uh, that that happens. Uh, we will uh, expect the, the full uh, detailed plan from NHS Tayside and its partners uh, by the end of uh, this month setting out exactly how 
that will happen and that then of course allows uh, that those actions to be uh, held fully uh, to account. So I absolutely understand uh, the uh, understandable desire of uh, the families to uh, know how these uh, matters have been taken forward and the, Men the Minister for Mental Health will uh, keep Parliament updated um, as these actions proceed. Richard Leonard. Uh, presiding officer, we must listen to the families. David Strang's report is entitled Trust and Respect. The families have told us that they have no respect for or trust in the Health Board to deliver on the recommendations made in this report. They are angry that nothing will change. We know that these families have shown immense courage. First Minister, now is the time for you to repay that courage. So will you commit today to give real teeth to Healthcare Improvement Scotland, to the Mental Welfare Commission and to fatal accident inquiries so that their recommendations are enforceable? And will you today instruct your Cabinet Secretary to re-escalate NHS Tayside's mental health services to level five? so that your government steps in to drive the transformation of mental health services in Tayside. First Minister, will you do the right thing? Will you put patients first so that no other families have to suffer in the way that these families have suffered? First Minister. Well, the government will continue to take uh, the action that is already underway and uh, I think is appropriate and we will consider all uh, suggestions. The bodies that Richard Leonard cites in my view do have, uh, to use his term, uh, teeth but we will always be open to suggestions for how the powers they have uh, can be uh, strengthened. The uh, Health Secretary has already met with uh, some of the families and continues uh, to be very willing to engage with them and to keep them updated as uh, this work continues. Uh, we will continue to monitor the progress of NHS Tayside through the continuation of the uh, Tayside Oversight Group, which is an important part uh, of uh, the, uh, the, the picture here. And uh, as I said, uh, the Mental Health Minister will keep Parliament updated and we have asked, uh, proactively asked Dr David Strang uh, to review this uh, after a year and to provide an update on the progress that has been uh, made. So this is uh, a matter that the Government will continue to be very closely involved in uh, with direct oversight from uh, the Minister for Mental Health who, as I said, uh, is uh, very keen to make a statement to Parliament after the recess when members across the Chamber uh, will have the opportunity uh, to consider uh, these issues in even more detail. Thank you very much. I have a number of supplementary questions. Uh, the first from Miles Briggs, followed by Neil Findlay. Miles Briggs. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Two weeks ago, my constituent, Darren Conker, was awarded £500,000 in damages following neg negligent diagnosis and treatment of an injury he sustained. The First Minister will recognise Mr Conker's name as he highlighted his concerns over his treatment to her as far back as 2007, at the time she was Health Secretary. Can I ask why his concerns were not investigated? And given the circumstances surrounding the case, will the First Minister today agree to an independent review? Uh, I'm sure the constituent uh, raised the issue with me as Health Secretary. I'm, I'm uh, certainly happy to look into exactly what happened after that. I'm, I'm sure Miles Brigg will appreciate I don't have the detail of that before me uh, right now, but I'm very happy to review uh, that case, what action the Scottish Government took, um, and uh, come back to him with the detail of that and be very happy to enter into uh, further discussion about uh, what lessons can be learned from uh, your constituents' experience. Neil Findlay to be followed by Ross Greer. Uh, this week's appalling report into mental health services at NHS Tayside is evidence of the need for openness and transparency in our greatest public service, the NHS. In that vein, does the First Minister agree with me that patients and staff of NHS Lothian have the right to know why the Chair of the Board has resigned and, more importantly, why the Health Board that spends their taxes and treats their children has been put into special measures? On Tuesday, the Health Secretary refused to answer questions from MSPs across the Chamber on this very, very important issue. So will the First Minister now instruct the Cabinet Secretary to release all information on Mr Houston's resignation and, more importantly, on the decision to invoke special measures for NHS Lothian? First Minister. In terms of the, the chair of NHS Lothian, as I understand it, he resigned because he uh, disagreed with the assessment of his performance as chair that had been made by 
the Chief Executive of uh, NHS Scotland. In terms of the decisions around uh, the escalation to level four of aspects of NHS Lothian's performance, uh, the Health Secretary has spoken about that uh, on many occasions in the Chamber and is con continues to be uh, prepared to answer the questions of uh, MSPs. And if there's particular information uh, that the Chamber wants, yes, I give an assurance that that information will be made available. Ross Greer to be followed by Beatrice Wishart. Thank you. Two weeks ago, in response to questions from Rachel Hamilton, the First Minister confirmed that while progress was being made on tackling air pollution in relation to some schools across Scotland, it's not being made everywhere. One of the places where progress is not being made is at Bearsden Primary in my region, where nitrogen dioxide levels have actually gone up in the last year and breached the safe legal limit for at least 49 hours, often coinciding with the times that children would be entering and leaving the school. One of the potential solutions to air pollution that the First Minister mentioned two weeks ago was a low emission zone, which you therefore agree with me that Eastern Bartonshire Council should consider implementing a low emission zone at Bearsden Cross as soon as possible. Uh, I certainly think it is open to the Council to consider that and the Government would be very happy to have discussions uh, with it in terms of how the Government can be supportive of that. As uh, Ross Greer is aware, we have uh, set out uh, our plans when we're working with uh, Councils in uh, our key cities to introduce low emission zones already, but there is no doubt that is the start of a process, not the end of a process. So the Government uh, and the Environment Secretary uh, would be very happy to discuss uh, with that Council or any Council uh, about plans they wish to take forward. Beatrice Wishart, followed by Tom Mason. Thank you, Presiding Officer. It's been seven years since four people died in a helicopter crash approaching Sumbra Airport, seven years without a fatal accident inquiry. The families need to know what happened to their loved ones. Lessons can't be learned, people's recollections fade, and all the while people in Shetland and those working in the oil and gas industry in the North Sea are anxious. At a preliminary hearing, Sheriff Principal Derek Pyle condemned the Crown Office for the delay and said that the wait for families should be, quote, deplored. Will the First Minister apologise? And isn't this further evidence that the Crown Office is completely incapable of handling fatal accident inquiries and that they should be removed from its responsibilities? First Minister. Well, can I uh, start by uh, conveying uh, my thoughts and sympathies uh, to the families concerned? I uh, know how difficult uh, the last seven years uh, will have been for them, and uh, I, I don't think anybody can see anything. I certainly can't see anything uh, that detracts from the suffering uh, that they have had. Um, of course, the decisions around fatal accident inquiries are, are not for me, and I, I don't say that in, in order to try not to answer the question, but constitutionally, decisions around fatal accident inquiries are for the Crown Office and the Law Office, so it would not be appropriate for me to uh, comment in any uh, detail at all about the decision-making progress there, other than to say that, as I think we all appreciate, every specific fatal accident inquiry has its own facts uh, and challenges associated with it. Uh, I am sure that the Lord Advocate will take very careful note of what the Sheriff Principal has said in this case and is fully aware of the impact on victims of any uh, delays within the justice system. Uh, I know that the Lord Advocate is committed to ensuring that everything possible uh, that can be done is done to ensure the completion of these very complex investigations as quickly as possible and I'm sure he'll be very happy to uh, correspond or discuss the matter further uh, with the member on behalf of our constituents. Tom Mason. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The new Forrester Hill Cancer Centre and Family Hospital in Aberdeen are now more than 60 million over budget. With the cancer centre delayed one year and the family hospital replacing the city's maternity unit delayed two years. The overall cost of the work has increased by more than 40% on original estimates. Does the First Minister think that these delays and spiralling costs are acceptable? Or does she regret that the huge problems uncovered in new hospitals in Glasgow and Edinburgh have caused my constituents, constituents to lose out on these vital facilities for a significant period of time? First Minister. Uh, well, of course, it's because of this government's investment in our health service that new facilities like this uh, will go ahead. We have uh, made sure that there has been close review uh, of the costs in this particular project, and I'm sure the Health Secretary would be happy to write to the member with further detail of that. But we are committed to the completion and the delivery uh, of new health facilities uh, for the benefit of patients in uh, the member's constituency and in other parts of Scotland as well. Thank you. Question number three, Alison Johnson. I am in no doubt that Derek Mackay's behaviour is appalling and I appreciate that the First Minister does not yet know who this young man is, but it is essential that he and his family receive all the support they need. 
Behind this week's stats showing more people waiting longer at A&E are stories that show the human impact that this is having on patients, doctors and staff. On Tuesday, we heard from a junior doctor about her experience working a night in a Scottish emergency department. She said, staff shortages. Me and just three junior colleagues, we can do busy, but when the department is so full, there are no beds for any of these patients, and I can't help but think I'm not giving patients the care they need. It's not safe. The fact of the matter is that we're short of beds in hospitals, we're short of social care packages, community services, and GP appointments. Despite the heroic efforts of those working in our NHS, the system as a whole isn't working, is it, First Minister? First Minister. Um, no, I, I don't agree with that. Um, I absolutely recognise uh, the intense pressures on our National Health Service. And as the Royal College of Emergency Medicine has rightly said, this is a whole systems challenge and we must bring to bear on that whole system solutions, which is entirely what the Scottish Government is working with health boards uh, to do. We are investing in our National Health Service, as will be seen again this afternoon in the budget, uh, to the maximum of our ability to do so. I know Alison Johnson uh, will agree with me and recognise, as I do, the impact on the National Health Service of 10 years of austerity that has not been the choice of this government or this parliament. But we continue to make sure there is record investment. We continue to make sure there are record numbers of staff working in our health service, including accident and emergency consultants and other uh, staff who support uh, the jobs that they do. And they do an absolutely uh, outstanding job. Uh, the pressures in our health service um, are understood, the reasons for them are understood, partly the changing uh, demographics uh, of our population. But it is worth noting that in the year to uh, December 2019, uh, the number of patients uh, seen within four hours uh, was actually, I think, at the highest level uh, in, than in any year since 2012, uh, more than one and a half million patients treated within four hours. And while waiting times uh, against our four-hour target are not where this government wants them to be, um, and we are working with health boards to improve on them uh, significantly. Uh, the context of this is important, and comparatively, um, if we look at our waiting times for the month of December, for example, which uh, were above 80% against four hours compared to under 70% elsewhere, in the UK, yes, we have to do better, uh, but because of the efforts and the investment uh, of the staff and of this government, uh, we continue to make sure that we see and, and will see uh, an improving picture in our accident and emergency departments. Alison Johnson. NHS staff do indeed do an incredible job, but my concern is the impact the strain is having on them. In 2011, former <laughs> Health Secretary Nicola Sturgeon published her 2020 vision that pledged to deliver healthcare at home and in communities. Well, 2020 has arrived and instead, A&E departments are busier than ever because people can't get GP appointments. The community health facilities we need simply aren't sufficient. Delayed discharge is as bad as it's ever been as people wait for the social care packages they need to enable them to leave hospital. So instead of being treated at home, we have a health system that leaves people with no option but to go to hospital and then prevents them from leaving. Yet again, another gap between the Scottish Government's rhetoric and its action. Can the First Minister see that her 2020 vision has failed? First Minister. No, I, I don't um, agree with that. There are more people being treated in the community than ever before. There are more uh, procedures and operations done on a day case uh, basis, for example, than ever before. And of course, that uh, has an impact on the judgments health boards make about numbers of inpatient beds that are uh, required. But we have rising demand for our health service. That's not just the case in Scotland. That is the case uh, across the UK and many other countries as well. Of course, the other thing that has changed since 2011 is the decade of austerity uh, that has been imposed on our budget and uh, by extension, the health service. So we will continue with the investment in our NHS and we will see further evidence of that this afternoon. We will continue to support record numbers of staff, but we will continue the hard work of reform uh, to make sure that more people where appropriate are treated in the community um, and our inpatient services are there for those who need uh, those services. Uh, and that that is done in the most effective way possible which is why, for example, we are uh, creating new elective care uh, centres. So this is 
challenging in the climate, uh, both the, of a changing uh, demography and uh, constrained resources. Nobody suggests otherwise. That's not just the case in Scotland. And while there are big challenges that I and the Health Secretary take responsibility for here in Scotland, uh, comparatively, I think our health service deserves a great deal of credit for dealing with and facing up to these challenges much better than we see in health services in many other parts of the world. Some further supplementaries. The first from Gail Ross, followed by Alex Cole Hamilton. Gail Thank Ross. you, President Officer. A policy paper from Professor David Bell says that post Brexit, fish exports from the UK are likely to face a mixture of tariffs and regulation that will inevitably add to their costs, making them less competitive. The report highlights the strong bargaining chip held by the EU in negotiations over fishing as continental markets are the principal destination both for fish caught by UK boats and for farmed fish. Does the First Minister have any confidence that the Tory party can keep the promises made to Scotland's fishermen? First Minister. Um, no, I don't have a great deal of uh, confidence in that. I fear, I, I hope I'm wrong about this, but I fear that the promises that have been made to our fishing communities by the Conservatives uh, are going to be broken in uh, the months ahead of us. Um, it is important, of course, that we support our fishermen uh, in terms of uh, their ability to catch fish in Scottish waters, but it's also really important that we protect the export markets so that those fish uh, can be uh, sold uh, into those markets and, of course, that we uh, retain the ability to attract uh, labour to our country so that the fish can be processed as well. So we will continue to stand up uh, in this government for our fishing industry and we will continue to do all uh, we can to protect our fishing industry from yet another round of broken promises by Conservative governments. Alex Cole Hamilton to be followed by Polly McNeill. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Figures released yesterday by the National Records of Scotland showed that 195 homeless people died in 2018. That's four people every single week. And Scotland now has the highest homeless mortality in the whole of the United Kingdom, with a rate more than twice that of England and Wales. This is a homegrown problem. Drug and alcohol use, suicide and exposure were the main reasons for those deaths. Nobody should be forced to sleep on our streets. And those figures point to a problem not just around housing or drug treatment, but in how we support those people leaving care, leaving prison and leaving our armed services, groups disproportionately represented in these tragic figures. What additional action will the First Minister take to bring these numbers down? First Minister. Well, can I thank Alec Cole Hamilton for raising this, because it is a, a very serious issue. I think these figures that were published yesterday are completely and utterly unacceptable. I would simply inject one note of caution that they are experimental uh, figures and therefore there is a degree of estimation, but that doesn't change uh, the headline that we are uh, discussing. Um, in terms of uh, the comparisons, the figures also showed uh, an increase in other parts of the UK, in fact, a, a bigger increase in England and Wales than in Scotland, but nevertheless, the levels in Scotland um, are not acceptable. So in terms of the work we are already doing, uh, the Ending Homelessness Together Fund is very important. The work we are doing around uh, drugs deaths is also very important. The work that I was standing in this very spot talking about yesterday in terms of uh, doing more to stop young people going into care and supporting young people as they come out of care, this is all interlinked. But I want to uh, assure the member and indeed assure the chamber uh, that it is an absolute priority across all of these areas of work uh, of this government uh, to address uh, these figures. I don't think we can escape the fact that one of the uh, driving reasons for a rise in homelessness has been welfare cuts and austerity, uh, and we have to deal with the consequences of that, but it is our responsibility and vital that we do deal with the consequences of that, and that is what we're focused on doing. Polly McNeill. Gordon Gibb, former Head of Professional Studies in Architecture, was instantly sacked for allegedly bringing Glasgow School of Art's reputation into disrepute after voicing his opinion on failings within the school, as he says, after a bust up with the chair, Muriel Gray. Surely, First Minister, it is the leadership of the board itself who presided over reputational damage. As 40 people have resigned from the school, Tom Innes was sacked without explanation, a further seven people sacked, 30 people made redundant. Will the First Minister remind the chair of Glasgow School of Art that it is, after all, a public institution and that whistleblowing is not a sacking offence, and that they are accountable to you. It is time, I think, for the government, I ask the First Minister, do you agree it's time to step in, use your powers to steady the ship, review the governments of this widely loved institution? First Minister. Well, 
can I say to Polly McNeill, as I'm sure she is aware, uh, Glasgow School of Art is an independent organisation. It does receive funding from the Scottish Government through the Scottish Funding Council, and uh, the Scottish Funding Council is able uh, to monitor the performance of it and other institutions that it funds. But it is an organisation that is independent of government and is accountable to its own board. Um, I certainly have no hesitation, uh, whether in this context or in any other context, in uh, reinforcing the importance of whistleblowing and protecting whistleblowers and uh, whether that's a message uh, to send to uh, the chair of Glasgow School of Art or any other institution, I unreservedly and uh, very clearly uh, do that. Uh, and I think it's important that everybody uh, acting in any uh, position in any public authority is very mindful of that. Thank you. Question number four, Stuart Stevenson. Okay, First Minister, in the light of the Prime Minister's statement that the UK will refuse to close maintain close alignment with EU rules, whether the Scottish Government will remain aligned with EU environmental standards. First Minister. Uh, yes, we will do that. We have already made clear our intention to maintain or exceed environmental standards after uh, EU exit. As announced in the programme for government, we will introduce a continuity bill that will include provisions to allow Scottish legislation to keep pace with EU law and will bring forward plans for effective and proportionate environmental governance. Uh, we don't accept the concept of weakening or reducing levels of environmental protection as a means to encourage trade or investment. Uh, like his predecessor, the Prime Minister set out a negotiating position without any consultation with the devolved governments that offers no guarantees on environmental standards and would take us out of the European single market and severely hit our economy, jobs and living standards. Stuart Stevenson. Does the First Minister re regret the failure by the Prime Minister to recognise that divergence from shared policies that have delivered benefits to workers, the environment and other policy areas will, far from uh, creating opportunities, will cost jobs and that it's in the interests of the Scotland to remain aligned with pan-national rules on such matters? Uh, yes, I very strongly agree with Stuart Stevenson on this issue. I think whenever we hear UK government uh, ministers talk about uh, the ability to diverge, uh, we have to ask ourselves what the purpose of that divergence would be. And the purpose would be to allow a race to the bottom, whether that is on environmental protection, consumer protections or workers' rights. And I think that is absolutely the wrong uh, direction of travel. Uh, EU membership, in my view, uh, while the EU is not perfect, EU membership has been good for Scotland. Uh, it has helped to ensure that we have high environmental standards, significant consumer protection and uh, protection for workers, and these apply consistently to all member states. A, a level playing field in law based on existing EU standards will provide certainty and continuity for our economy and businesses, and it will help our progress to a net zero economy. So I'm determined that Scotland will remain aligned with our European partners on devolved matters. We will not accept any regression of protections, and I uh, still hope we will see that same approach taken across the UK. Morris Golden. The SNP are set to miss a range of environmental targets this year, from biodiversity and active travel to recycling and low carbon vehicles. Why? Uh, the SNP, uh, sorry, the Scottish Government is um, a world, a world uh, leader um, on a range of environmental issues uh, and we continue to make progress where uh, we have to accelerate that progress. We are open and frank about the need to do that. But, you know, we are uh, standing here talking about my desire uh, as First Minister and leader of the SNP uh, to remain uh, within a context uh, that obliges us to meet these high EU standards and I'm being questioned on that by a member of a party that wants to diverge from these standards and actually lower these protections. So I think I prefer my approach to keep moving things up the way and in the right direction and to resist the race to the bottom on the environment, workers' rights and everything else that the Tories want to see. Claudia Beamish. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, can I ask the First Minister when will interim measures be put in place to replicate the oversight and enforcement roles of the European Commission and the Court of Justice on environmental issues such as air pollution to properly protect Scotland's future uh, of, of our people and of nature? First Minister. Uh, we will announce those proposals very soon. The Cabinet discussed uh, this issue in detail and uh, looked at our uh, final proposals on this uh, this week at our uh, regular Cabinet meeting um, and we'll outline uh, the direction we intend uh, to take uh, as soon as possible and I'm sure the Environment Secretary will confirm the precise date of that uh, shortly. Number five, Brian Whittle. 
Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the First Minister what action the Scottish Government is taking to support young people dealing with mental health issues. First Minister. Uh, we're determined to ensure that any young person requiring support for their mental health has their needs met. We're taking forward a programme of work to transform the children and young people's mental health system with a, a focus on prevention and early intervention. We've invested £250 million over five years to support positive mental health for children and young people, in addition to £58 million over the last four years specifically uh, to improve access to CAMS. Uh, last week, uh, sorry, this week, we launched a new uh, national CAM service specification, which was developed in partnership with young people and their families, which outlines the level of provision they can and should expect to receive when they're referred for help within the NHS. And we will work closely with NHS boards on implementation of the specification. Brian Whittle. Can I thank the First Minister for that answer? But uh, currently, one in five young people are rejected from CAMS, and around 20% have to seek multiple referrals in their attempt to get help. The audit of rejected referrals recommended that a multi agency assessment system should be developed, which would essentially end multiple referrals. This week, the Government published its new CAMS specification framework, which does not mention a multi agency assessment system gives no clarity to the referral criteria for CAMS and offers no guarantee of a face-to-face -face assessment. So, First Minister, given these significant omissions, what assurances can you give to young people that they will get the help they need at the first time of asking? First Minister. Well, as I said in my original answer, we have this week launched uh, the new service specification. As I, I said, that has actually been developed in partnership with young people and their families. Uh, the Mental Health Minister, I'm sure, uh, would be happy uh, to have further discussion about particular details of that if the member uh, wants to pursue that. More generally, um, one of the issues I uh, readily recognise is the issue of rejected referrals and long waiting times for access to specialist uh, CAMS services. That is exactly why we're not just investing, uh, we are seeking to transform the nature of these services so that there is more support available for young people in the community. And of course, uh, we're investing in more counsellors in schools and the creation of the new national wellbeing service so that we have a situation where uh, those young people uh, who need uh, specialist services get quicker access to the specialist services, but those who don't need that are treated in the community because some young people uh, right now will be referred to CAMS because there is no adequate uh, community provision and that is what we are working and investing in to rebalance. Fee. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Studies from across the UK have shown that a significant proportion of individuals being treated with antidepressants actually have undiagnosed bipolar disorder. And given the government's failure to tackle long waits for CAM services, what will the government do to ensure young people receive appropriate mental health diagnosis and the specialist support that they need? First Minister. Well, of course, as I know Mary Fee will recognise, prescribing decisions are not for me to comment on as a politician. It is important that clinicians uh, take decisions around uh, the appropriate prescriptions uh, for any patient. But it is exactly... Uh, what I've been talking about in uh, response to Brian Whittle, that is effectively the, the response I, I would give here. We do recognise the need to have a broader range of services available for people with mental health uh, challenges um, and for more of them to be available in the community. And I think that's particularly important for young people, which is why the investments that I've already spoken about, uh, rebalancing how we provide mental health uh, treatment services is so important and I hope helps. Although, as I say, uh, individual prescribing decisions will always be for clinicians, I hope helps in the longer term to address the issue that Mary Fee has raised. Question number six, Colin Smith. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the First Minister what the Scottish Government's response is to reports that Police Scotland is centralising specialist surveillance officer posts away from Dumfries and Galloway. Minister. Uh, keeping Scotland's communities safe from those involved in criminal activity remains uh, obviously Police Scotland's top priority. Uh, decisions on how to allocate pre police resources are, of course, for the Chief Constable to take. Police Scotland has stated that this decision uh, would not mean any reduction in the service from local policing as officers continue to do their job to keep uh, communities safe. Uh, while a final decision on the location has yet to be taken, specialist police surveillance resources uh, fully capable of preventing and detecting a range of crimes will still operate fully and continue to support the fight against individuals and groups that threaten our communities. Colin Smith. Thank you, President. Officer. Dumfries and Galloway was the first region to lose its police control centre with the loss of 34 jobs when Police Scotland was established. If you walk the corridor 
of the police headquarters in Dumfries. You're not going to bump into many people because so many local support jobs have been axed. And now we hear that the axe is about to land on the local surveillance unit with yet more jobs being centralised, taken away from a region at the, as the gateway to Scotland and on the front line in the battle against drugs. First Minister, why is your message to young people in my region that if you want a career in Police Scotland, you need to move out of the area and into the cities? Surely any definition of a national police force needs to include that force having a fair distribution of specialist jobs in every part of Scotland. Or First Minister, is the south of Scotland not part of your Scotland? First Minister. Um, with the greatest respect, I think that is a, a ridiculous thing uh, to say, and that is not, not my message. This government, through the investment decisions uh, we have taken, are maintaining uh, amongst record high numbers of police officers in every part of our country. And I think that is extremely important in terms of discharging our responsibility to keep communities safe. But it is also the case that it is for, and it must be for the Chief Constable, to make operational decisions about the deployment of resources in different parts of the country. Um, and that includes specialist resources. If I uh, was to seek to dictate to the Chief Constable how he deployed the resources at his disposal, I'm pretty sure that some of the members uh, criticising me at the moment would be up on their feet in this chamber saying how outrageous it was that I was doing that. I trust the Chief Constable and I trust our operational police force to make the right decisions about deployment of resources um, and use those resources in a way to maximise the safety of our communities. And I think all members uh, of this chamber should trust them likewise. Thank you. And that concludes First Minister's questions. We're going to move on shortly to members' business. A members' business debate in the name of Monica Lennon on World Cancer Day 2020. Uh, but before that, we're just going to shortly suspend Parliament to allow members, ministers and the members of the public to change seats. A short suspension. <laughs>